have a very, very special guest who I've been following for quite some time and learning a lot from. For those of you who don't know this amazing man with a lot of experience in many different realms, this is Robert Edward Grant, and he's known for many, many different things. He's been in the business world. He's moved into, he's still in the business world, but he's moved into the more spiritual realm, understanding the connections, the organizations of all, mathematically speaking, connecting a lot of different things to ancient Egypt, understanding the maps and the codes that we've been given through work like da Vinci's work. And those are things that we're going to be speaking about today. Now, for anybody who doesn't know you, can you give your form of an introduction of who you are, where you come from, and how you've got to the point that you're at today? Okay. Well, I, uh, I've had kind of a, a long <laughs> pathway, I guess, to get here. I'm 53 years old. I, uh, I have lived in nine different countries. I learned eight languages. Um, I've had such a passion for life and travel. Um, I worked in the healthcare industry for most of my career, but now I span into many different sectors of industry in total. Uh, I'm into clean energy. I'm also into uh, healthcare and uh, different aspects of healthcare. But also, in addition to that, I'm into uh, fintech. And I'm in cryptography and uh, cryptocurrency also. Uh, so uh, I have a group of companies that spans, you know, I have 17 different companies that span all kinds of different stuff, including now as well, uh, augmented reality and a spiritual life simulation game that we've just created, which is really mind-blowingly fun and cool. I'm an inventor. I hold many uh, patents, about 60 uh, patents. And I, uh, I love life. And my spiritual side really started in earnest in a major way about 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago. And uh, I started realizing that my life was not what I thought it was. <laughs> I think that was when I started waking up to this notion that maybe what I thought I was living in is not what I was actually living in or experiencing. And I had a very different kind of two aspects of my life. One was sort of my LinkedIn life or was my business life and all mm -hmm. the things I was doing. Cause I had to sound like legitimate, you know, I have investors and things like stuff like this. And, um, and then I had a very different life that I started posting my work in geometry and mathematics and such on social media, like Instagram. And then it just took off. It took off like crazy. And then I realized I had two totally separate lives that I was managing two different worlds on social media. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, I work with a team that now helps me with my social media. And I told the team two years ago, just combine it all. Yep. Because I can't be one person and a different person in a different circumstance. It's it's always unique. And, and I'll give you a little background here also, but it's always unique for me and always fun for me to see somebody that can come from the you know hardcore business world. Because usually those people, especially somebody with the amount of knowledge that you have in like the world that people think is the world, it's very hard for them to see anything else. And anytime I see somebody moving from that side to this side and not choosing one over the other, but bridging the gap between the two, that's the biggest thing. It's usually people go to both extremes and you found this way to bridge the gap and do all of it because it's really all one and the same if you know how to balance it. So it's, it's, I mean, it's an honor to be able to be speaking with somebody oh, like. Thank that. you. It's my it's my honor. And I heard the I heard a lot about about what you were doing while I was in Egypt from Anand, who was also yeah. on the trip there, and um, and other folks that were there as well. And you know, for me, I was in the spiritual community. I would have been considered, you know, something like Darth Vader about ten years ago or fifteen years ago, mm -hmm. because I was a pharmaceutical CEO, which is like. You know, you could practically hear the dun, 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 <laughs> dun, 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 dun. And I, I like to think of myself as not being, you know, I, I always wanted to change the pharmaceutical industry. I probably wanted to, I thought people would change. And then I realized after a while that that's not really the mission. <laughs> it's not the mission to change people. Yeah. Uh, it's to learn to love and accept. Um, and that was a big aha for me. But, you know, I didn't like the way the pharmaceutical industry was run. I still don't. You know, I, I feel like even though I accept that it exists the way that it does, I still feel that there are certain uh, systems across society that no longer serve humanity. And there is where I'd like to kind of take my unique combination of things and to help somehow help be a catalyst for positive change and helping to build a better new system or better new systems 
And I think pharma is is one of those areas. I think corporate uh, is another area that, you know, across the board needs a revamp. Um, I think that government is another area that needs a total revamp. And I also believe that religion is another area that probably needs a total revamp. So all these structures in society that have been established to almost be the arbiters of good and evil, uh, what is lawful and what is unlawful, mm-hmm. what is ethical and what is unethical, uh, you know, what is truthful and what is, you know, mistruth, then those different societal structures we have, I think, are all now starting to dissolve and they're starting to to crack at their very foundations. And and I, I, I believe that that's part of the reason why I am happy to be involved here at this time, because I, I know that I can probably hopefully play some role as some sort of a catalyst, at least, to maybe look at things differently, because I've always... I always thought it was kind of like a curse. I didn't realize until much later in life that the way I saw the world was very different than most people did. Now, what, I, what caused you to see that? Uh, you know, I think it was it was probably after a thousand or so meetings where people are like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> and and maybe th- saying things like, "You know, Robert, we like you because you're like, you know, you're you're kind of on the edge of crazy, but." Uh, you know, also you come up with some really out there ideas that can be genius ideas as well. And and so I realized that the difference between a crazy old man and a charming older gentleman is probably just a few million dollars. And which is hard to hear, but it's, it's true. so true though, because true. that's the way society looks at it, right? If if you've been successful and you can ground whatever it is that you're saying into some reality, then you're like Elon Musk. You may not be exactly like Elon Musk, but you could be like an Elon Musk. Whereas if you're just a guy talking about stuff and it, you know, can't pay the bills and can't do the the life of being here in this world, then people will just label you as kind of nuts. And even, even though you may not be, and that's the that's the even though you may not be. No, yeah. and I don't think one is nuts and the other one is is not nuts. I think they're probably equally crazy and equally <laughs> not crazy. And I, I think, but to think that the world, and this is where I came to the realization, that the world is kind of just like perfect the way we thought it was, that's probably crazy. A hundred percent. I always like bringing people back to like, whenever they're like, whenever I say something and they're like, that's crazy. I'm like, wait a second. Do you do you understand what's going on in the world today and how it's going on? If we ever speak about, let's say, I brought an example to somebody once. I said, imagine I told you that there was this thing that could change form from pretty much one species to another species. And they're like, that's impossible. I'm like, we call that thing a caterpillar. It turns yeah. from, from <laughs> yeah. a caterpillar into this thing that flies. You know, or imagine there was this, thing that could change its gender without going undergoing surgery. And they're like, that can't happen. I'm like, well, there's a fish deep in the ocean that knows how to do that. I found that one on, on deep blue planet or something on one of those. Mm -hmm. So it goes to show you that whatever we think is crazy is really, in my opinion, just a limitation of our current level of awareness. Because a hundred years ago, if I told you what we were going to be doing in 2020 and 1920, you'd be like, you're a psychopath. You're off the wall. You, we can't do that. And the only thing that changed was not not what's impossible, but what we know. So it's this like journey of awareness of expanding that awareness, which you're bringing to the table now through all the work that you're doing. Well, it's it's been fun to kind of go to that realization of, you know, the boundary conditions of entropy. People use the term entropy, which is another word for chaos or randomness often, but I don't really believe it. I've now come to the stage in my life where I believe that everything is patterned, but our Mm -hmm. consciousness is limited as to what we can understand. So let's say that 4,000, 5,000, or however many thousands of years ago, mankind figured out, because there's an argument on both sides of this, that there was a relationship between the diameter of a line through a circumference and its circumference of a circle that would go around that line, right? So the line as a diameter versus a circumference. So there's a direct relationship. We know that relationship is, is pi, right? We now know it as pi. But in the world before we understood that, it could have been to mankind that didn't understand the length of how to measure a circle. He could have said, well, that's entropy. It's random. 
I don't know how long the circle is, but there's a fixed relationship to it, right? So the moment we understood the mathematical constant of pi, we pushed the boundary condition on entropy further away from our knowledge, right? So you could say that that entropy might just be the, the boundary that signifies the end of our knowledge and the beginning of our ignorance. It doesn't mean that the rest of it's not patterned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are probably infinite number of mathematical <laughs> constants that we don't know or understand or what their function is. And we probably only know about 10 right now. Across physics and math, there's about 100. But maybe understanding the language of communication with this universe could actually be measured by the degree to which we can understand pattern and perceive pattern versus perceiving randomness. And that that is constantly a process of pushing that boundary condition farther and farther out as we expand our awareness and consciousness. So that this actually then leads to this notion of, well, maybe the way that we see things is defining our reality. Maybe our perception is literally our reality. And that's what physics actually says. The last Nobel Prize that was given was given on the basis of entanglement of quantum systems, right? So quantum entanglement. And what it basically posits is that local realism is false. What we consider as real is not real at all. And this is right on Scientific out. American. I pulled it up right here. Scientific American, the universe is not locally real. And the physics Nobel Prize winners proved it. I'm really, really glad you brought that up. Listen, you're, you're bringing things right now that are, they're not complex. You're making them simple. What you're pretty much saying, and, and tell me if I'm understanding it the right way, is what we perceive as chaos is simply the limitation of awareness of where we're at to understand the order of yeah. So I like to say randomness is really just our inability to perceive God's pattern that is encrypted. And as we break through the encryption, through by peeling back the layers of our own consciousness and expanding, therefore, by putting ourselves in challenging situations through this matrix of mind so that we will constantly be forced to grow, even though sometimes it's uncomfortable, we can push that boundary of inability to perceive pattern further and further out from us. And the next encryption right now that we have is a dimensional encryption that we call time. Time is an encryption that keeps you from going into, its perception is very, very persistent. Einstein said, time is just a persistent illusion yep. of our perception. So if we can break out of this notion of what time is, you can start to go into a higher dimension. And that's exactly where fifth dimensional awareness is. It's in the eternal now. What does that look like? So let, let's bring what you just said into application. What does that look like? The way I perceive time is a measurement of the movement of light. It's everywhere, all the time, everywhere, relative to where you are to that light. You know, so- but What so, if I said, what if yeah. I said that light doesn't actually travel? Okay, I'm listening, keep going. Okay, so I know that's provocative, right? It sounds what, but we even use the term the speed of light, mm -hmm. right? But what if I said to you it doesn't actually travel? So let me give you an example. So you've been to a stadium at a football game or something where they do the wave, right? Yes. Okay, so when you do the wave, you stand up and you sit down, right? Now, let's say that you're a photon. You stand up and you sit down. The mm -hmm. person next to you stands up and sits down, and then the person next to them, all the way around the stadium. Now, what's actually traveling? If you're the photon, did you travel around? You didn't go around the stadium. It was the wave that went around the stadium. Correct. And what you have is two positions. You have on excitation and off excitation. What, what does that mean? So let's say that the field, right, of, of what we call the Higgs field, right, has a, or this field of electromagnetism, right? Okay. Has a way to excite, be turned on. And so the light comes on and the light comes off. And then the one next to it comes on and then goes off. And then the one next to it comes on and then goes off. Each one is a cubic aspect of space time. It's like a pixel space. on a computer. Like a pixel on a computer. So if we're looking at playing Pong on our computer, that 70s game, are the light photons actually traveling or is each LED just going through its on excitation and off excitation mode? 
Okay, I'm with you. I'm with you 100% right now. Now, let's mm -hmm. take the next step. Okay, what, so what are you saying that that means. So what that means is that what we perceive as light speed is probably actually the speed of our perception. Wow. Wow. So think about that for a moment. The speed of perception. Now, how did I derive this? I derived it through prime factorization. So prime factorization is the thing that we use for encryption. It is literally the thing we use for encryption. So all of our encryption today, today is based upon multiplying two large prime numbers together and forming something called a public key. So that public key is a large semi-prime number. It's the product, multiplication, of two smaller prime numbers, right? And so the public key is going to be the length of one of the keys and the other key that multiply together to create it. And then you take the length of each of those numbers and you double it, right? Effectively, and they're both the same size number. And then you have a larger number. So this is what we call 4096-bit encryption. That means to make a 4096-bit encryption, you're going to have two numbers that are 2048-bit that will okay. multiply by each other, right, to create that. Now, to find the actual number of decimal digits, you divide that by 3.32. So basically- okay, I'm, I'm, I'm getting lost, I'm getting lost. I need so, so for example, that. you've heard of a, a, a number like a 4,096 bit, you've heard of that before, yes. right? I, I know okay. like 256 bits, so I'm assuming- Okay, it's... so 256 bit. So okay. how many decimal digits would go into 256 bit? I'll tell you, okay. 77. A number with 77 digits would be classified as a 256-bit oh, number. Multiple. That's the 3.32 multiple. I understand. Exactly. Okay. okay. So now you've got large numbers, the two numbers that are 77 digits long. They multiply together to create a number that's two times uh, 77 digits. So it's 155 digits. I understand. Right. So you take one of these large numbers and it takes a really long time to find those two prime factors without, because you have to do a, you have to do a trial and error test. Oh, so that's how it's encrypted further. By I just explained to you all encryption. So your bank account is protected by something called an RSA or an elliptic curve, which is a, a derivation of the same thing. Okay. A very large number that has two smaller numbers that multiply to create it. And those two smaller numbers are your private keys. And they don't worry about it getting cracked. They publish it because it takes a really long time to crack large numbers. And they rely on the time it takes. Now, how long does it take to crack to find the two prime factors through a trial and error process for the fastest computers in the world to crack a number that is 2,048 bits, which would be, you know, 617 digit long number, 300 trillion years. Now, how does that factor to time and light and what you're speaking of? Because there's a certain amount of time complexity required to basically crack this number. So this would be like looking at a distance through space time, a super far distance for us to be able to see something at very, very great distance that could be 300 trillion light years away from us right? It becomes a function of our ability to focus on an object through time, through this vast degree of complexity. So what happens is this math equation can happen one way very fast. I can take two very large numbers and I have a giant calculator here. I'll show it to you. Okay. So we, we created this calculator because we needed it for a lot of our complex computation stuff. And like universe, we're going to be releasing it eventually to the world because we want everyone to be able to use this because you can see patterns here that you wouldn't otherwise see. When you only have 15 digits, you can't see patterns. It you doesn't mean the patterns aren't there. The patterns are definitely there. You developed this? Yes. Yeah, this is called, this calculator is called the big fucking number calculator. <laughs> the, the, the acronym for it is BFN. <laughs> This is unbelievable. Right. So, so, so why do we do this? Well, because if I take this number and I try to factor this number, it's going to take me trillions upon trillions upon trillions of calculations of trial and error. So if I took five times seven, you know, the answer is 35. 
right? We memorize those numbers, so it's easy. So if I said, what are the two factors of 35? You'd say five and seven, and those happen to be prime numbers, right? Well, what had happened was I discovered the method to predict prime numbers infinitely and published a paper on it. Can you show me what you mean by that? Yes, I will. So this was my hand drawing of when I discovered it. I just put numbers in a spiral of 24, which relates to Fibonacci because every Fibonacci pattern repeats every 24 numbers mm. when you look at it in digital root analysis. So this is a paper I published uh, at Cornell. Okay. Right. And it's called Accurate and Infinite Prime Prediction from a Novel Quasi-Prime Analytical Methodology, which was a new number that we had discovered in the process. My partner and I, Talal Guanam, who's a PhD physicist and mathematician. What do you mean by new number? So a new classification of numbers. So what I realized was that if you look at this chart right here, what I realized is that um, it looks like a roulette wheel, right? Okay. All this is, is it starts with the number one, and then it goes in a circle like a 24-hour clock to the number 24. And then the next cycle comes out like this, like a spiral. And it starts at 25, and then it goes up to 48. And then 49 goes to 72, okay. each with 24 blocks, right? Each one of them as a part of a 24 spiral. What I noticed was that once we get beyond the numbers two and three, every prime number, without exception, always ends up in the spoke number five, spoke seven, spoke 11, 13, 17, 19, which and are all prime numbers, which are all prime numbers, except that not every number is prime. So what I found when I looked at this mod 24 chart like this was that there were numbers that are green. So the red numbers are all prime. So then I asked myself the question, well, why are the green numbers there? And do they have a common denominator? And I realized that the green numbers were all divisible by prime numbers. Interesting. That's the pattern that you found. That's right. And so prime numbers beyond two and three, the only place that numbers divisible by prime numbers will show up is on the same spokes of this wheel. And what do you, what do you make of that pattern? Well, the green numbers then become something called quasi prime which means that there are numbers that have a special characteristic, means that they're divisible by primes, but they have another characteristic as well. They have the characteristic that they're, that their inverse values, the one over X value comes yeah. out to sum to the number nine. So I'll show you what I mean. So, so basically let's take a number like the number seven, right? So if we take the number seven and we take one over seven, what do we get? you'll find that there's a repetition cycle, 0.142857, and then 142857. And each time these six digits repeat, that's called a period. Okay. So a periodicity means it's got a cycle, like it's rotating. Now, let's say that we're going to take another number that's a quasi-prime number. Well, let's try this with the number 77. So now we can see that there's a period as well. So you've yeah. got one, two, nine, eight, seven, zero, and then one, two, nine, eight, seven, zero. And then one, two, nine, eight, seven, zero. Again, right? 27. You get your nine. Right. So it keeps exactly again 27. So these numbers have a characteristic that was heretofore unknown that all quasi prime numbers will end up on this chart exactly here in these same spokes which then allows me to do something that was previously impossible, which is I can now predict primeness. Now the question is, knowing this, and I, this is now what you mean by a new classification of numbers. So I, yep. I understand that. Knowing this, how do you apply, you're calling mathematics the language of the universe, which with the little I know, I completely agree with that also, because it makes sense. You could break everything down to energy, which goes to your numbers and now everything sort of connects. Mm -hmm. The question is on a on a on a more like broken down summarized version for the common person. They look at this and they say, "Okay, we see these new classifications, we see these patterns. Now, what do we do? How does that change our life on the day to day?" So, how does this refer to us? What does this even mean? Well, from a practical standpoint, I didn't know when I first published it, but then people started saying, "Hey, wait! If there's a geometric relationship to primeness." then can you crack prime numbers with geometry? 
can you crack large encryptions, right, using just geometric approaches? And the answer is yes. So I'll go ahead and show you. So I can grab here a public key number. Usually a bank size would be 2048 bit. Tells you how many decimal digits it is, 617. So you just saw that it should take 300 trillion years to crack this. Well, now using a derivation of Fermat's factorization method and Pythagorean theorem, I can do it geometrically and it's already done. Whoa. I did it in one try. Right away. And it took me 57 milliseconds. Aren't you worried that people can use this for negative purposes? Oh, yes. That's what why we created an entirely, that's why we created an entirely new encryption that's not founded on this. Because this as a construct is a limitation related to perception only in the third and fourth dimensions. So once you go into fifth dimension, you've got quantum computing and you've got new geometric approaches. So you're basically you're basically breaking what we thought were our limitations of perception through this. Correct. Oh my God. Now, what does that actually mean? What it actually means is this. Our eyes have already been performing quantum computing level computational complexity. How? Because our eyes, the lens of our eyes, is actually defining a prime factorization matrix. So you may not know this, but you have a lens inside your eye. The lens inside your eye is about roughly the same size. It's a little bit smaller than your iris. So if you look at your eyes in the mirror, the brown part of your eyes, right behind it is a lens, and the lens is made of something called ectodermis. Ectodermis is the same material that's hair and fingernails, right? As you age, how old are you now, Jason? 25. How, how old? 25. 25. Okay. So as you age, you'll start to, you're still a ways away from it. Once you get to about 40 years old, I got some time. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to start noticing you have to wear these things. Right. Okay. So, and I like to joke about, it, I'm like, Oh, it's not that my eyes are bad. It's just that my arms aren't long enough because I can't hold things far away from me. And then once they're so far away, the type size is too small and I can't see it at that stage, but my distance vision is fine. Well, that's called presbyopia. Everybody gets it when they turn about 42. Like everybody. Okay. okay. So what's happening is you have these muscles in your eye that stretch your lens. As it stretches your lens, it allows you to focus on things at distance. But your lens becomes less elastic with time, right? Because it's just getting old. So when it releases those muscles and the lens is supposed to come back so you can focus on near vision, mm -hmm. and it's going to make that lens take on more of a convex shape when it pulls it and stretches it, it's making it take a concave shape, right? So it's concave is like this. Convex yep. would be bowed out like this. So when it pushes back, it doesn't go back to its original position. As you age, that happens more and more. And so because your lens becomes less and less elastic. But what's really happening is that your brain is doing a complex computation from the moment that you're able to focus on your mother across the room versus her being right in front of you. When you're a little child, you might remember you could focus on your hand like this close, but as you've aged, you can't focus that close anymore. Your focus has moved out to about here probably, right? Your brain is doing the exact math I just did. Wow. And it's doing it with cross vast distances. We can accommodate up to 15 diopters of correction, right? What's a diopter? A diopter is a power. Right. You could say like powers of magnification. These glasses would be like one and a half diopters. So I can okay. see things near. Right. So it's giving me one and a half magnification power. Okay? okay. So a diopter would be a magnification power classification. So what our brains are doing is it's having to correct based on when you focus on something at far distance, which it would then be at 15 diopters of accommodation. And then you need to read something. So you look something far away and then you look at your iPhone. Your brain just took time complexity mm -hmm. to do the prime factorization to readjust your lens exactly to the size that it needs to be so you could focus on your iPhone again. And it's doing it instantaneously, pretty much. And it's doing it instantaneously. And we track that as time. There's a limit on our speed of perception that relates to our limit 
of focus of observation. So, that limit is the speed of light. So really, we're calling it the speed of light, but it's the speed of our perception. That's that's yep. the paradigm shift we're having over here. That's a major paradigm shift. Because then you could say, well, what if we lived in a VR, AR game, right? Or virtual reality game. And you'd have a limit because it takes a while. If local realism is false, then what's behind me that I can't see may not be there. It's just a wave of potential, right? In quantum physics. Yeah, yeah. So, but in order for me not to cheat the game or to cheat the system, there needs to be a limit on the speed of perception. And the speed of perception allows for the thing behind me to render as I'm turning around to observe it. So this goes to the, what's it called? The, when, when you observe and you don't observe on the, the, you know, double those, slit phenomenon. Yes. Yes. This is connected to that. Yep. It's exactly what it's connected to. So the architecture of the game allows for the game to render itself according to your thoughts of perception, because you get in this world what you expected you were going to get. We're literally looking through an, a continual lens of observation bias. And we I'm don't gonna, even know it. I'm going to ask you a really big question right now. Mm -hmm. You believe the human being, as the human being, has the potential to break that game? Yes. How? Um, it can, there are still certain limits within the construct, even in higher dimension. But as you expand higher dimension, you can, you can think thoughts and you can render those thoughts instantaneously, right? As you break through these different layers of consciousness, you don't have to do it independent. So in other words, as you start to transcend beyond duality, okay. you break yourself. It's almost like Yoda said, you must unlearn what you have learned. Can we call duality local reality as well, coming from yes. the same place? Yeah, okay. in many ways it's connected. So okay. it's not a coincidence that the world's going through a global awakening spiritually, and then now all of a sudden science is mirroring that reality. Yes. By saying that local realism is dead. So if local realism is dead, then all science as we know it is turned upside down. Everything. Because there, it's not like biology exists without physics. Physics is just what underlies Biology. So it starts with mathematics. Applied mathematics is geometry. Applied geometry is physics. Applied physics is chemistry. Applied chemistry is biology, biological systems. Applied biology becomes psychology. Biological systems now working in a psychological way, communication with each other. Then collectively, we call that sociology because it's applied psychology. Applied sociology then comes to a philosophical realm that we call philosophy. And applied philosophy comes back to mathematics, which is really, really the simplicity of ratio. And it keeps going in that, in that cycle. Exactly. So what we're doing here is we're going through these experiences so that we can learn more who we are and remember why we're here and what we chose to learn and experience. Now, that means that it's literally like an AR headset or something, right? And and I did a, uh, I'm doing a podcast soon with this fellow by the name of um, Donald Hoffman, who's a, a an incredible psychologist and mathematician, who I can pull this up off my Instagram page. Objects, definite values of position or momentum or spin when they're not observed, and that th those definite values have influences that propagate no faster than the speed of light. So the first one is called realism, that they have definite values. And the second part is, is locality. It means that they influences propagate no faster than the speed of light. Everybody has assumed that local realism is true and it's false. Stop it. it. That just came out. And then they got the Nobel Prize for it. What is it saying about like the table, let's say, that it's not really local, that what is its fundamental reality then? It means that it doesn't have a position when it's not observed. It Got doesn't it. have a color so, when it's not observed. Right. It, it, okay. It, if you don't have a position when you're not observed, then you're not there. That's why local realism is false, because the space, time, and objects that we see are all of VR. This so we render everything. them as we need. And so that's it why changes it changes everything. It changes everything. 
And this is where it gets personally kind of freaky because that means your own body is just an avatar. The one intelligence projects itself into multiple avatars so that it has a chance to learn to love. So are you kind of mind blown? Wow. It's, it's beautiful. It's the most beautiful truth there is because it's, it's really the only truth there is because it's all that exists, not disconnected from anything else. That's, that's what all of this brings me to over and over and over again. It, it can make me cry. It is, it is beautiful. And, you know, I'm looking now for this video I posted with Neil deGrasse Tyson, and, um, and he did a really nice job to sort of explain this. Oh, here it is. the fact waiting for someone to convince me that we don't live in a simulation i've heard you say it the arguments put forth have been quite convincing most of the best arguments are traceable to a guy named nick bostrom a philosopher at the university of oxford here's the argument our computing power is growing rapidly we create simulations of worlds we have video games with characters that are inside the video game imagine a day where you can simulate a world so perfectly with life forms humans so well that you can recreate every single neurosynaptic thought you could have but now you're in the simulation on the computer so including the perception of free will so now we would have enough computing power to imbue the sims inside of the program with all of the human traits that we possess now correct not only our human traits, but the world. But the world. The world itself. Right. And you don't have to have all the world existing there at all times. That might be an unrealistic amount of computing power. You just need... Enough the, of the world that they see around them. Nothing that they see around them. Right. So you want to start digging. And oh, that's so funny. And I haven't put the earth there. There's a flag that goes up in the programmer. And they say, oh, need more earth. And so, right. so they put earth beneath you while you can keep digging. It's like the Truman Show. For example. Or the Minecraft, you can build Or stuff. Minecraft. Minecraft, right. Oh, that is Minecraft. Right, right. Okay. God, that guy's a brilliant genius. Okay. So, and we went to the moon. It's okay. Let's make sure the moon is there. Right. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that's why we can't travel faster than the speed of light. Because if we could, we'd be able to get to another galaxy before they can before program, they it. program oh! that galaxy. Oh! oh! <laughs> Dude, <laughs> so much fun. Does that answer your question now? It's un. <laughs> <laughs> We can, we got to have a longer conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fine. Keep going. So many places. Yeah. One second. One second. Let let's 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 take a pause. Okay. Let's let's take a step back. I have questions. Okay. The way that I understood, and I'm saying understood. Okay, because now that through this call, I'm really it's 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 I'm awakening as we speak. It's unbelievable. The way that I understood perception, or at least did my best to explain it through my understanding, is as follows, and I want to hear your thoughts about it and how it connects to what you know. Just like a computer works, let's say there's a computer that's this physical object, and then there's a website, facebook.com. A website is source code. You have your source code that's not actually like buttons and comment buttons and all that you know fun stuff on your screen it's just that source code and the job of the computer is to take the components or, or to take that source code and through the components of the computer the the hard drive the ram the cpu whatever it decodes the source code and projects it into this simulation of organized light that we experienced as facebook.com and in that same way the way that i understood it was there's this source code, which probably goes back to, back to mathematics and numbers. Mm -hmm. Everything breaks down to it, aka light, which is also mathematics. Mm -hmm. And the infinite source code is not decoded. It's just infinite all potential all the time. And mm -hmm. then our components, the eyes, the brain, the nose, the nerve endings, X, Y, and Z, take this light through its uh, physically, through its different components and then decode it and then project it. So really nothing's existing, existent outside of you. It's the decoding process that's consistently happening that allows us to experience this illusion of perception that something is happening outside of us. And in that way, we all create our own reality through the decoding of light as a projection of that form. Yeah, I'm going to take it even one step further. So do you agree with everything that I just said? Is that pretty much? Yes. Okay, so please so have a look at this. So you have a unique light signature that is you. 
Jason Shurka. Okay. But you're not really that color, right? You think that you're the color that you are, but actually that's just reflection color. You have a whole nother spectrum of you that's the absorption. So let's take an example of hydrogen. This is what the spectral reflection of hydrogen looks like. So if you looked at, you know, spectral analysis of hydrogen, it would have a color purple, another color that's more violet, and then kind of this bluish color, and then this light blue, and then this red pinkish color, mm -hmm. right? That combination of colors is how we know hydrogen exists. I don't understand. So when we look into outer space, and we use a telescope that that does this spectroscopy, and we could see across the entire cosmos, we know where hydrogen pockets are, where there's a high preponderance of hydrogen based on the color reflections that come out. Interesting. Okay. That's how we know what something is. We know that copper, like if you're looking at some material, you don't know what the material is, you can look at a spectral reflection analysis and be able to tell exactly what that material is just based on the colors that are reflected. Okay. The unique combination of colors that are reflected. Now you understand that you have DNA. Yes. Your DNA is a unique signature of you. Okay. It has a unique light signature. There's never been another DNA like yours and there never will be another DNA identical to yours. Even though you're 99% the same as a monkey, that 1% that makes you different makes you infinitely different, right? Inside that differentiation is what makes you Jason Shurka, okay? okay. So that means that you have a persona, right? Which would be these colors right here, your reflection. And then you have a shadow which that shadow would be the exact opposite. So all the colors that are used for the reflection are not part of the absorption. That's why you have blacked out lines here. Interesting. Okay. So that means you have all the rest of the colors in the light spectrum that are not you. Well, you perceive they're not you. Well, what if those colors simply get projected back to you as reflection in the world around you? Keep so going. therefore, I'm and the mathematics of this, the mathematics of this is something called the Rydberg formula. Okay. And, and Niels Bohr, who was a famous Danish physicist in the 1930s and 40s, who worked closely with Einstein, he was more on the quantum physics side of things. He basically found that you could exactly predict based on the frequency of hydrogen, its spectral emission of color. And it was exactly accurate. And this is called the Bohr atom model. And the mathematics of it is simply X and one over X. So they used here lambda. So it's lambda and one over lambda. So you have this differentiation that would then tell you these specific nanometers of light would be converted directly from the spectral or frequency rather of hydrogen, which then I can derive to know exactly and predict exactly based on the frequency of hydrogen, based on its one over X calculation, what its nanometers of light signature will be. And what Either is that? nanometers or, or angstroms? It's, it's exactly these lights, right? These lines right here. So this is measured in nanometers. This is 400 nanometers, 500 nanometers, 600 nanometers. Our 700. spectrum is between, I guess it says it there. I was just reading about this last night in this book called Light, the Me Medicine of the Future. Yes, uh, I was it was explaining, you know, pieces of this of how our perception is between 400 and 700 nanometers. It's actually 360 and 720, because what we're really looking at is one octave of light. We have 89 octaves or 88 octaves of experience across sound, thought at the very basis becomes sound, it becomes microwave, it becomes infrared, becomes ultrasound. And then it, as it goes higher and higher, light is just the 55th octave above sound. So you just keep taking up to higher and higher octaves of frequency, and now you're in the terahertz frequencies, right? So what happens is you, you just go all the way up until the 55th octave, the 55th octave from the very beginning is light. And that's the only octave a visible spectrum. Gotcha. Beyond that, 
are all the other octaves. Then you get into cosmic rays, gamma rays, et cetera, right? It goes X-rays, all that. So what happens is this visible light spectrum is the same as looking at a piano keyboard, and it's just the note G on the piano keyboard, middle G, because that's the 55th note on a piano keyboard, which is a Fibonacci number. So basically, you look at the piano keyboard, you've got the entire spectrum as a microcosm, right? Which then we can expand and just put lots and lots of 88, put 88 piano keyboards next to each other. And the 55th one is the one that yields light. And the other ones are not yielding light, but they're yielding different forms of sound that we have different senses to be able to sense. And the ones we can't sense, we can sense through the pineal gland. I wanted to bring that there. I was literally, that, that was the, the next step I was about mm -hmm. to take. I wanted to ask you one question. Would you agree with the statement that all is light and all light is mathematics? Yes. And, so, and I would say it's not only light because the absorption of light, a lot of people think that darkness is the absence of light. Darkness is not the absence of light. Darkness is the opposite condition of light. What does that it's mean? The, the opposite condition would be You've got a field of, of little nodal points that are cubes. Each of these cubes has a little LED inside of it. Think of it like an LED. Mm -hmm. And there's an on excitation and an off excitation. So the opposite condition of light is the off excitation. The, uh. the condition of light is the on excitation. It's a field, Right. And it's like just like a gigantic LED screen in three dimensions or four dimensions or multi dimensions. Very, very high, high knowledge technology. So, so the minute. okay, go ahead. I, I, I have a lot of questions here. Another question going back to the on excitation, off excitation of how you're explaining the wave, the wave. Mm -hmm. in, in, in the football stadium or whatever we were talking about. Let's say I represent a pixel as a human being, mm -hmm. not light, whatever we call that. When I take a step forward, am I taking a step forward? Or is it, am I moving through space? Or is is that, the, you know those cars when you were a kid, you would like move and the, the ground below you would move and it looks like you're moving, but you're really staying in the same place, but you have the illusion of moving forward. Would you say that the human experience is what, or the, the deeper core of the human experience is you're not actually moving forward when you take a step forward and it's space that's moving through you, that's giving you the illusion of moving or, forward? Or maybe to take it to another mind-blowing level, mm -hmm. what's happened is the pixels that you thought were you are not actually you. They're just reflecting the light signature of you. And as you move to another place, it's just like the wave transitioning. You move to another position, then a whole new set of pixels have been on excited to represent your light signature. Just as if you're in a screen on a TV, yeah. not actually moving. What's happening is that there's a whole new set of pixels that are reflecting you. The only limitations that exist, therefore, are the ones that you persistently believe in, including time. The yeah. world around you is just your spectral absorption being reflected back to you and your X and the world around you is your one over X. That's why I call it the U inverse. <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. So with that spectrum of you're saying not four to 700, 360 to 700. Yeah, because the 360, it's 360 to 720. 360 times two would be the doubling of its octave, right? But in this case, nanometers that are shorter, right, wavelengths are becoming the opposite, right? So what's what's happening is it's it's 360 goes to 720 or 720 goes down to 360. And it's it's basically like a, a backwards view of it. But when so you look at it in angstroms, it's the opposite. Go you ahead. were mentioning dimensions when I asked you, do you believe it's possible to break that? game and and move past the limitations of what we perceive yes uh, of the, and you said yes so as you move through different dimensions can you do that while being in the physical body yes can you elaborate on that because i think that's something that we need to discuss and it's a longer discussion than a few minutes but at least we could you know plan so this is where it goes to hermeticism the first principle of the seven hermetic principles is mentalism what does that mean? 
Mentalism means the entire universe is mental. It's not material. You have to realize the entire universe is mental. That what you perceive in the reality around you is not material. It's a, it's a compelling belief that you have that actually forms the world around you. Your expectation becomes your reality. Just like the double slit phenomenon. This is why double slit phenomenon does what it does. You know, in one context, and it works retrocausally even. So that means that if, if a photon of light is either going to be a wave or a particle, and its dependence on whether it'll be a wave or a particle is going to be dependent on whether or not it will be observed, it will even know before it's observed if it's going to be observed. And retrocausally, it will know, even if you didn't observe it, that you might observe it later on. And so it will act as a particle. Because there is no such thing as linear time as we construct it. That's just an illusion that we create for ourselves to experience this linearity of time. But actually, everything's happening now. All dimensions of time. Every reincarnation of Jason Shurka throughout time exists simultaneously. So really, it's not past lives, it's parallel lives. Parallel lives. And you can jump into those. I don't believe that there's a different universe for every decision point we made that you can jump into different decision points. I'm not, I'm not of that. What I do believe, though, is that what is explicable uh, from the perspective of Mandela effect, which is when a group of people have a memory of something that didn't really happen, mm -hmm. like millions of people, like people remember Nelson Mandela's death in the 1980s. It never happened. I mean, he died in the 2000s, something. He didn't die in the 80s, but people remember watching his funeral. They remember watching it for hours and mourning it and everything. Like millions of people. How do you explain How did this? this happen? Well, as you move into higher frequency, the world around you shifts to that frequency. As you move into higher dimension, the world around you starts to shift to that new reality of your perspective. So that also creates changes retrocausally. So that throughout time, you literally live in what people refer to as a different timeline, right? Things change. Things that you might remember from the past, now you look them up, like, Luke, I am your father, which was the famous line, right? He didn't really say that. Go back and look. You know, I remember growing up with Jiffy peanut butter. There's no Jiffy peanut butter. There's Jiff. These very slightly different nuanced things that I remember so strongly, like Febreze. Stuff like so you, stuff you put with the drying, you know, you dry. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's not spelled the way that we thought or the Flintstones, right? It's all these things are retrocausally changed. As you move into higher dimension, your past, present and future now reflects the new frequency that you're at and things that were not part of that frequency, little aspects of it start to dissolve in, in the past and in the future. So it's not that I'm jumping through different timelines per se, because in one lifetime, I decided to be with one woman in another uh, circumstance. I decided in the same lifetime to be with a different one. And so I could jump into a different lifetime if it didn't work out for me one way or another. No, I don't believe that. What I believe is that as we raise consciousness, the reality around us through all dimensions of time also changes. It's a mind blower. Like, no matter how you look at it, this because is so I, deep. I always ask the question, I'm like, okay, what's next? And it's like, it keeps going. And I, there really is no destination. You know, it's, it's just this, this ongoing infinite cycle that, like you said, we're remembering who we are. So and I can go through the detail, right, of, okay, here's what you do, right? But I think throughout time, when people come to this understanding, they don't explain in the end all the scientific methods that they derived it and how their perception shifted. What they say is the result of it, which is, yes, they'll always say that we're in an illusion. And that I kind of had an inkling of quite some time ago, and then finally it really locked into place. And now science is actually parroting exactly that. But what they do say is that it's all about the transcendence of judgment, the transcendence of duality. This notion of looking at the world as being either good or evil 
it's realizing also that the things that we judge negatively are the things that we attract in our lives over and over again. We literally become a hammer that's seeking a nail of our own self-validation of being a light worker, right? The thing that's going to fight the bad thing. When all along, maybe you're the designer of your own game experience. All of it for the benefit of your own conscious expansion. And to realize and remember who we are. And also to realize that the reason we're here is not to learn more judgments, but rather we're here to learn how to love. We're here to learn how to love and how to receive love. Because that's really what happens. When we look at ourselves, the things we don't like about ourselves start projecting over and over and over again in the world around us because those aspects of the higher self, of us, of the self, the full self, when you are in your complete authentic nature, combining both the part of the you that you want the world to see in one light, like I had my LinkedIn on one aspect, and then I had my Instagram on another. When you finally combine and become the authentic you, and you fall in love with your experience, that's when you become enlightened. Hmm. Because then you fall in love with everything around you as well. It's a love fest. Even when bad things happen to you, you realize well, wait a minute, throughout time, what I thought was a bad thing that happened to me actually turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to me. So time has this aspect of polarity. And it's just like music, if you know musical interval. So I could play a note, C, and then go to E, and that's the, one of the most beautiful chords in music. It's called a major third. Mm -hmm. But it's inverse, and most people, when they hear a major third, which is just da, da, and often you'll hear it with a perfect fifth, Da, 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 right? And you play all three together on a piano. Sounds great. Fabulous. Whoa, it's like love. Uh, it's awesome. Everyone <laughs> play those chords on the piano. But if you play them backwards, if you go in a descending arc on that, so I just played an ascending by going da, da, da. If I do a descending arc of that and inverse the order of it, so it becomes instead of C to E, it goes from, from E to C, yep. right? And it's going down, that becomes a, ma a minor sixth. A minor sixth is negative. People, when they listen to that, they're like, oh, that sounds like heartbreak. Why? So isn't that interesting? That chords of music, one direction through time, because the only difference in music could be like a time tracker, is that I played the order different. But the same two notes that I play I play in the descending order through time and it turns from joy and love to sadness and heartbreak. What does that say to us? What it says is that the experience we have of love houses and embeds the seed of heartbreak. The wow. experience of sadness has within it the seed of love and joy. And that's true across all chords of music. And what I'm going to tell you about the pyramids is that there are chords in music, right? The major third that I just told you is five over four relationship. It's 1.25, five divided by four. It's simple. So if you take the Hertz frequency of a C note, multiply by 1.25, you're going to get an E note in Pythagorean tuning. It's perfect. Okay. But so then now if we take the inverse of these, right? And we start looking at all of these different relationships. A perfect fifth would be da, da, da. So that's the first and the third note. So it's da, 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 da. That's a perfect fifth. Perfect fifth means stability. It's stability. You feel secure, stable, safe, right? That is a relationship of three over two. And then the sound that we have when Darth Vader enters the room is what I already did. Dun, 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 dun. That is a diminished fifth, which is like the most terrible sound of music because it always makes you feel like a villain just entered, right? Wow. Well, guess what? The pyramids on the Giza Plateau, the height to the base, one half the base of Menkari Pyramid, the smallest pyramid, is five over four. The height of the Khafre Pyramid, the second pyramid, the one in the middle, is is four over three, which is a perfect fourth, which has its inverse as a perfect fifth. 
And the, the, the base to height relationship of the Great Pyramid is the diminished fifth. The Great Pyramid is actually the imperfect or the unfinished man, unfinished mankind. All of the musical intervals, there are 13 musical intervals, 13 total. Every one of them is represented perfectly in the proportional dimensions of all three pyramids. So when we look at the three pyramids on the Giza Plateau, we are looking at the architectural form of musical interval representing all musical intervals. So it's the full spectrum of sound, which is the absorption. Sound is the absorption of light. Sound carries mass. And its representation, representation then in light form would be a rainbow of light. We're literally looking at, when we look at the Giza Plateau, a rainbow spectrum of light. All musical intervals are perfectly represented. If you don't believe me, do the research. Look it up. You will see. And we only discovered this a few weeks before I went to Egypt. We're literally looking at a musical key. And that's what the pyramid complex is. In terms of the individuals who built them, do you believe that they were human? I believe that what we believe in this simulation construct and what we perceive as time that's linear is entirely different from what it actually is. What we perceive as distant history is equally our far future and that time loops on itself. Okay. Time is a torus that loops on itself. So what we are going through is cycles of time that cycle back on itself. What we believe is that time only goes one direction right now, but in the fifth dimension, it goes flows forward and backwards. Everything is retrocausal, right? And this is why things like Mandela effects start to show up. And this is exactly where I would say that the pyramids were built. I believe that they were built 13,000 years in the past, which is also 13,000 years in our future. At the midpoint of the cycle. What do, that? what do you mean by that? Well, okay. We live on a globe, right, that represents our space, our relationship with space. If I walk west, I'll end up walking through the ocean. But let's assume I get on a boat and I go all the way west, or I take an airplane and I fly to Tokyo. And then from Tokyo, I go to Shanghai. And then from Shanghai, I go to Moscow. And then from Moscow, I fly to London. And then from London, I go to New York. And then from New York, I go back to LA. Okay. Right, which is close to where I am now. I went west continually, but I ended up where I started from. I understand. What if time is the same thing? A lot of people think the earth is flat. Well, I believe we live in a simulation, but I don't believe it's a flat ball. I mean, I could believe we're in some like Wally world type vat somewhere in some vat of jello or jelly. And we're like playing some game and living this life. That could be with some headset on or something like that. Who knows? But I believe that the simulation is a spinning sphere. And this spinning sphere, because I've been on airplanes and I've flown west and I've gone all the way around the world many times. And I've flown over the North Pole and over the South Pole. I've done both directions many times. I've visited 140 countries. So what I would say to you is that if you did not have the opportunity in history to be able to get on an airplane and fly around the world, or be able to see the curvature of the earth when you're on an airplane, and I've seen it many times, many, many, many times, then you could easily think, well, without that added perspective, if you're too close to the tree, you can't see the forest, so you might think that the whole thing is flat. Okay, fine. But actually, once you get up into a mountain, you can start to notice these things. The higher the mountain, you start to see this, and the horizon does start to bend a little bit, yeah. right? It's a seven degree bend. It's what it is. And that was discovered by Aristosthenes long, long time ago by using two poles and one in Alexandria and, and, and one in down in Thebes, right? And they measured at the same time of day, the amount of shadow cast against the pole of the same length. And they were able to then calculate using Pythagorean theorem, exactly the 40,000 kilometers of the circumference of the earth. Pretty amazing. And they did that a long, long time ago, thousands of years ago, because of the way the shadows were cast. Okay. So what ha what happened between that? Where because it kept going. Okay, 
it's a globe. And then they thought it was flat with their maps and how they believe. And they're like, okay, it's a globe again. And now we're going back into the cycle of, uh, by the way, I'm with you on the, on the spherical globe shape, but there are a lot of people that say, Oh, there are a lot of people on it. Yeah. So, so here's the thing, right? If, if you didn't have the ability to go high up in the sky, or you haven't flown a lot of places in the world, then you may not have had the experience to see that. So it's a different perspective, right? And I respect that. I respect it. So for them, their truth is they really truly believe, and I believe that they truly believe the earth is flat because they haven't experienced it otherwise, right? But here's the thing. What if time is the same thing? What if your experience with time is directly tied to your different aspects or perspectives, points of vantage that you could actually perceive. So for example, we think of space time as being kind of, we think of space, we think of time and time space, but actually the two things are directly tied together. There's nothing, there's no space without time. There's no time without space, period. Yep. Period. And gravity is tied directly to time. But yet at the same time, you're saying none of them actually exist. That's right. But these concepts are inextricably linked in this construct. And there are certain things you can, you actually can depend on, like our measurement systems, our mathematical numbering systems. When you get into hermeticism, you start realizing that the architecture of the game is locked down on numbers. It's locked down on measurements. All of our measurements have a divine basis. The meter, right? The cubit, the foot. We're going back to cubits as a measurement. It's an ancient measurement. Isn't that kind of funny? We're going back to the cubits. The pyramids were built according to that, correct? They were built according to the cubit, but actually we found that the pyramids were built on all three measurement systems. So the foot, the cubit, and the meter are fundamentally built into the Great Pyramid and all of the great the pyramids on the Giza Plateau, all of them. They're, it's fundamental. The amount of the indentation on the sides of the Great Pyramid, because each side, there's actually eight sides on the pyramid, there's a... Okay. One meter indentation. Mm -hmm. It's one meter, the indentation. It's like, wait, what? The Euler number is a famous mathematical constant that governs expansion of waves, wave expansion. And it also governs squares and scalar waves. So light is transverse waves. So whenever you have light, you have a transverse wave. Therefore, you have pi because what makes the transversality of that wave is pi. Right. But what's going to make the scalar wave that goes along with it that you can't see that's surrounding it, going along with it and forming the structure around it, or we call gravity, is the Euler number. Well, the Euler number and pi are always together. Euler is 2.718. It's a mathematical constant. It was discovered by uh, Charles Napier and also by Isaac Newton at the same time. So the 2.718 number is what governs all expansion of waves and exponential growth. So for example, you put money in a bank, the amount of interest you get on that money is going to be directly tied to the Euler number. The maximum amount of interest you could get, even if you compound that interest every minute or every second of the day, it will max out at 2.718 against your one. You'll never be able to get more than 2.718 times your money, your original $1 put in. And this is why Jacob Bernoulli used the Euler number to calculate all interest, and it's still used today for all interest calculations at all banks everywhere, right? It's the Euler number that does it. But what people don't realize, it's actually making squares and pi is making circles, okay? And so it's forming a limit. So if there's a limit on the speed of light and on perception, speed of perception, it's also going to be the limit on exponentiation, which is the Euler number. Now, what's this got to do with anything? Well, the <laughs> Euler number, the Euler number is, if there's a speed limit on the speed limit, of the universe, then the speed limit on the speed limit, it's actually the Euler number because it limits all wave expansion and growth. It can't go beyond that point. And that became then our speed of perception. So the Euler number is actually what defines our speed of perception. Think of it that way. That's how I see it. You call it the Euler number? Euler. It's spelled E-U-L-E-R. Here's an easy way to remember it. The number is 2.718 is the value. But the word oil in German, E-U-L, right, is the word for owl in German, like a bird, owl. An owl has the unique characteristic that it can spin its head 
uh, 271.8 degrees. No way. Now, the mathematicians named it not after the owl. They named it after uh, Leonard Euler, who was a Swiss-German mathematician who used it in Euler's identity, right? E to the I pi plus one equals zero. It's supposed to be the most beautiful equation in all of mathematics. So the idea is that, wait a minute. <laughs> so this means that we have this mathematical construct of a universe that is derived on our perception and a combination of our perception with our observation bias. And we call this Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Mm -hmm. That we have our own unique light signature, that unique light signature that we think is us, who we are as individuals, is actually just part of a larger whole. And the world around you is actually your own unique experience with a repetition cycle. I showed you repetition numbers, right? How they repeat over and over again. And you have a repetition cycle because every time you use a prime number and a prime number is your representation, then the universe around you will have a repetition cycle as well. You will have patterns in your lifetime. Those patterns is what you will call the patterns of, or repetition cycles of samsara, the life. So, like life in the good. matrix. And all of it was chosen by you to experience for your highest benefit in learning to return to oneness and to realize and remember who you are. You know, you, you mentioned that one of your, your best friends is Israeli. In Hebrew, we call what you just said tikkun. And tikkun is the word for your rectification. Pretty much, most people see it as like a negative thing, and it's not. It's the very thing that you came here and chose to experience for, like you said, your highest good to get past those very things. So it's like every culture, every every religion, every people every nation has this in their own way one way or another but then it brings me to another question this is bringing me to a lot of questions but <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna pick and choose some of those questions if we're going there into the the spiritual route now and now connecting it to everything that you're saying what is your perception how do you understand or define a new soul and the formation of a new soul. If all exists, how does something like that happen? What is it? That's a good question, right? And I don't, you know, everything I've said to you today is just my own learning, right? And of course, I've gone through and studied lots and published lots. You can read my papers and everything on this type of stuff. And I do it with other fantastic scientists and, and human beings, because I think even to refer to someone as only a scientist, sort of cuts them off from their heart center. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the next iteration or evolution of mankind is actually about heart-brain consciousness. It's realizing that the two have to come together, and that requires the rise of the feminine in each of us. The rise of the feminine is not only for women, it's for the men as well. And it's about finding that balance. Science is starting to catch up. And the answer is the higher knowledge can only be achieved through a spiritual doorway. You cannot get better at physics by only studying more physics. You'll hit a wall. The way you have to get around that wall is to go into your heart and practice your art. I'm a sculptor, right? I, that, that phoenix behind me is one of the pieces I did. I, when I have a, a mind block on something, I go into my heart and draw art, geometry, um, or I sculpt or I play music or I compose music. And all of these things, you know, my most recent book is this one. It's called Polymath, right? Polymath just means many learnings. And we in society pigeonhole ourselves into saying, okay, this person is a scientist or this person's a lawyer or this person's a that. I think the age of doing this is coming to an ignominious end. I think we're now moving to an age of beingness. It's not about, I am not what I do. That might be, I have certain aspects of my career that I have to, you know, do and entertain, but it's not who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, we have become a world of human doings over the last few hundred years. It's time to become human beings. 
And that means you can have multiple careers and multiple pathways, multiple perspectives. And the way you can expand your consciousness in particular is by expanding your perspectives. Seeing different viewpoints, traveling the world, right? Expand your consciousness. So now let's apply this to time. So I just said, if you could go up onto a mountain or fly in an airplane and fly around the world, your perspectives have shifted. You will see, or let's say a pilot flies you over the South Pole, like I've done because I flew from Tierra del Fuego at the base of Argentina over the South Pole exactly on my flight to Australia where I lived in Sydney. I, I, I lived, I learned eight languages. That helped me get different perspectives. 100%. Right? Just like you came up with this word, like tikkun, right? It's the same thing. You have a different perspective, which is uh, something that can bring knowledge and illumination to everyone else because you, you shared it with us, right? And now it's stuck in me, so I'll remember that, right? And so this whole notion of time then means that if we have lifetimes that only last 72 years, what if we simply don't live long enough to be able to zoom out and see the perspective of the arc of time. And that maybe one degree on that cycle is exactly 72 years, which is sort of an average lifespan on earth. It's true. And guess what? If we multiply that out by 360 degrees, 72 years will give us 25,920 years. What a coincidence. That's the exact same length as the earth's wobble the procession of equinox. So maybe this cycle of time has just always been going all along, but we've lived on it since such a short amount of time that we only experience one degree of iteration change. Do you believe that there have been people in the past or maybe even now that we don't know about that are living several hundred years? I fundamentally believe that there have been moments in time in history where mankind has lived much, much longer lives. The Sumerian Kings list is a good example of a you know, historical record of people living thousands of years. I mean, the Bible is another one. You know, Methuselah lived 969 years. I mean, they knew what a year was. They explained it what it was. No, you know, Robert, every time when I speak to people about that on the level of like the Old Testament, the Torah, I always have, you know, debates with rabbis. And I bring that up and they're like, no, 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 they counted time differently. And in the beginning, I didn't have what to answer until I read it myself. And I said, wait a second, Abraham and Sarah, let's go to, let's go to Sarah. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't have children. The yeah, story so goes, the angels, yeah, the, the angels came, blessed or whatever. And then a year later, within the year, she had children. So let's say terminology of within the year would have been different. What couldn't have been different is the fact that it takes nine months to produce a child. And I brought that to them after like a year or two of them saying, no, 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 you don't know what you're talking about. And they just shut there. They didn't know what to say. They're like, they're like yeah, okay. Well, I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that I believe that our, our entire notionality of what time is, is entirely wrong. And another way of looking at time is, you know, it's funny because the word itself, if you, if you write it backwards, it becomes emit. What I was just showing you with spectral emission is light's emission, which is the, you know, the way we can refer to the emission of time is time being, you know, light being emitted and time is its opposite. Well, guess what? Time is the opposite of light's emission because time and gravity are the same thing. Time and gravity. Gravity are the same thing. Keep, go. Time and gravity. So you've seen the movie Interstellar, right? Okay, so then you know oh. when you land on a planet of greater mass than Earth, you could be there for a short amount of time, and yet many years could pass on Earth. So, for example, the length of our year is 365 days. What people don't realize is that it's also 354 days. 354.8 days is the lunar year, right, based on the moon calendar. Okay. So if we take the 365.25 days of our sun's year and we we mix into that with the uh, leap years, then the exact average time or the mean value of a year when you mean average the sun calendar and the lunar calendar is 360, exactly one degree for each day. 
Wow. 354.8 plus 365.25 comes out to 360 divided by when you divide it by two. By two. Right. So and it's like perfect, especially when you add in the leap year. It's like, what the hell? What? You, are you kidding me? So we've just been ignoring the feminine aspect, which is the moon. We've been using only the, the sun's calendar. So the point is that when you go to Jupiter, if you landed on a ship on Jupiter, because of the mass is greater there, time would be very different for you. We would go through 12 years of time where you would only age one year. On Jupiter specifically. Jupiter is 11.86 years to each one year here. Your time is relative to the mass that you are basically interacting with. Wow. Wow. And it's not all coincidence. You know, the fact that we have a, a perfect solar eclipse can only happen because the sun is the exact same size in the sky as the moon. With you the distance in between, it's perfect. Yeah. So what are the chances of that? The only way that could be is if the diameter of the sun is exactly the same ratio difference to the diameter of the moon as the distance from Earth to the moon compared to the distance from Earth to the sun. And it happens to be exactly 400 times. So the moon's diameter is 2,160 miles, which is half of 4,320. Wow. Multiply that by 400 times, you have 864,000 miles. Wow. Right? The speed of light is 186,400 miles per second. You just put one on the front of it. There are people who, what's, what is your response to people who say the moon is artificial? It was built. It's too perfect. I think this entire universe is artificial. It's built. It's too perfect. And guess who built it? You did. I understand. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful answer. Wow. So this it changes the context. It's a reframe on everything in your life because now everything that happens to you isn't happening to you. You chose it. So stop asking, why did this happen to me? And start asking, why did I choose it? And if you're an athlete, you're not going to go into a sport where you're not going to be challenged. You're going to go into a sport that's going to tear the muscle. You're going to go into an area where you're going to be challenged because that's the most fun. When you finish that game or that sport, you're like, whoa, that was tough, but I did it. So we cannot assume how everyone would assume to come into this world and what they would assume that they would want to experience. Now, Helen Keller is a good example of this. She was deaf and blind and a paraplegic. And yet she came up with profound quotes that impacted the world over tens of millions of people by saying the only thing worse than blindness is to have sight without vision. The only thing worse than blindness is to have sight without vision. Wow. So I extended that the other day on my podcast I did with Blue of Earth. And she's, wow. you know, she's challenged with, uh, with losing her hearing. And and I thought to myself, because I was on a flight recently to Salzburg, and it's kind of one of the music capitals of the world. And I was thinking, what would it be like if I couldn't hear? What would be worse than not being able to hear? And I, and I was thinking about Beethoven, who sawed the legs off his piano so he could write through vibrations the Ninth Symphony, which is one of my favorite symphonies. And I thought, well, the only thing really worse than deafness is probably to be able to hear without empathy. I think that's what the world is missing. So what I've tried to do is share my story and my experience. And to me, it's it's been a beautiful journey. And it has helped me to reconcile all the things that have been in my life I thought were irreconcilable. But Sharing it has been powerful because I know I'm just sharing it with the world around me. And it has increased also my empathy towards other people's condition and what they are experiencing. Because I, I don't believe I'm here to judge. I believe I'm here to learn to love and learn how to receive love. And that's what's important. It's beautiful. You mentioned some of your work, and I think now is a good time to bring this into everybody. 
If you haven't yet, you know, found Robert's work, robertedwardgrant.com is where you can find pretty much everything podcasts are your courses here as well robert yeah they're all there you go in the explore if you go in the explore button and also i do trips and stuff to egypt and and they're like uh pretty fun trips and you can find everything on that page it's um, awesome so all there. really everybody if you want to learn more about what you're hearing over here and i know i do and i'm going to be doing this and i'm getting your book right after this to read it but go to robertedwardgrant.com. You know, Robert, there's one person, everybody always asks me, one person you could sit down with, have a conversation with at any point in time, who would it be? I'd really want to have the unexpurgated conversation with Leonardo, I would say. Because I really think he's not known as an enlightened avatar, but he most definitely was. And he figured out how to traverse through time. I have no doubt about that. And I feel like a lot of what I'm decrypting uh, and what our team is decrypting is related to his work in particular. That means he encrypted it as a time-based encryption. And, and I would say, actually, you know, even beyond Leonardo, I would want to speak to my higher self. And that's me unseparated. You know, I had an experience in my, my last trip to Egypt, we made a lot of new discoveries, some of which are going to rock um, the foundation of what we consider history mm -hmm. of, you know, who built the pyramids and everything. Uh, we discovered reliefs and depictions on all the walls in all three pyramids. And they're not, let's call it at all, related to the dynastic period Egyptian stories. They are related. The Great Pyramid is related to the story of Osiris, which is really the story of Orion, the hunter. And it's really mankind's death, burial, resurrection, and reincarnation cycle through the experience of from Adam in the Garden of Eden all the way through to today of cycling through samsara, this repetition cycle, the same numbers over and over again. But there's a way to convert that into a golden experience and Every number has its own golden ratio. That could be the subject of another podcast. Please. But I can tell you, every one of us, in all of our imperfections, the Great Pyramid, I don't believe, ever had a top. We are the top. We are the Pyramidian. And I believe that it represents the imperfect man, and that when we start to see ourselves in our own divine perfection that we are, you know, I spent the first half of my career in the medical aesthetics industry, I launched Botox and Juvederm and Latvan and Latisse. I had a very successful career. I was president of Allergan, big pharma company. I was CEO of Bausch & Lomb, another big pharma company. I spent my life trying to help people to realize your, right, in the collective sense, your ideal. Whatever your ideal was, you wanted you know, larger breasts, you can have larger breasts. Now I try to convince everybody not to do that. <laughs> but please, Jason, don't get larger breasts. Um, uh, you know, I was thinking about it, but I'll yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll sleep on it. But from any, any way that you perceived your ideal, that you could realize your ideal without judgment. But now the second arc of my life is really about realize that you are ideal, just as you are. And that your perfection is your uniqueness. There's never going to be another person with your light signature. There never will be another person. There never has been a person with your light signature. That is to be celebrated. You're the most valuable thing in the universe. The way you see the world adds more to the Akashic record of information for the universe to put in its infinite file system of its own expansion of consciousness. Just as we want to expand consciousness, so does the entire universe itself. And that it does so through our eyes. And that is a very, very beautiful thing. And it changes the context of everything we experience in our lives every single day. And it can change the amount of empathy that we have both for everyone around us, but most importantly for ourselves. Wow. Listen, Robert, you, you, it's, I feel leveled up after just listening to you for the past two hours. And I, I really can't say that every time. It's usually when it comes to books, it's one in every 20 books. I get bored 
And then there's that one book that's like, whoa, you know, and it wakes you up and then it brings you to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know, you know, very clearly and publicly here that you just did that to me over the past. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I've enjoyed uh, talking with you. I do have to go now, but uh, it was such a pleasure talking with you. When you come out to California next, uh, please let me know. 100%. 100%. It's been an honor. It's been a pleasure. And we will definitely be in touch. I want everybody to go to robertedwardgrant.com. Go check out this man's stuff because a lot of us have a lot to learn over here. Again, thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you for being so, thank you for being a polymath. (laughs) <laughs> well, thank you. Not really, you, you get you, you. Everybody's a specialized, you know, expert in something nowadays, and we've lost the time of being able to bridge the gap to show how everything's connected to everything. So, you are what some people were a few hundred years ago when people knew a lot about a lot, and I think we need to get back to that in that cycle, like you say. We so, will. It's part of this cycle. It's 100%. part of the water bearer and the age of Aquarius, and that's where we are now. And I'm excited for it because it's like. It's not going to come without some bumps. I'll promise you that, but it will come. So some patience and most importantly, patience for ourselves. Have a great day, Jason. Great to meet you. And if you see my friend, Adam, please tell him I said hello. Thank you very much. All right. All the best. Bye-bye.